And joining me now from their brew factory, from their brewery in Ottawa, are the uh, Shillows, Ben and Jamie, who are the founders of Shillow Beer. Welcome to the CJN Daily. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Happy to be here. Great to have you. Congratulations on uh, the achievement of uh, starting and building your own brewery, Bricks and Mortar, in Ottawa. Thank you. (laughs) It's been a hot summer of COVID. And, um, you know, with the pandemic happening, I know that some of your plans to, to, to launch this had to sort of take a few detours. So why don't you walk us through where you're at now, what is built, what is open, what is not, just give us a little background. Um, so yes, we did pare down our original business plan. We wanted to have a tap room. We wanted to, you know, have a little, um, place where people could sit down and, and have a beer and eat. Um, so a lot of things had to shift during, uh, during the pandemic, um, with restaurants being shut down, it didn't make sense to, to do some of the things in our plan. Um, so basically we decided to just get, get the brewery built and get to producing beer for retail sales. So that's what we have now. We have a brewery that produces beer. Um, We are currently canning all of our product um, and then we have a retail store open so people can come in and purchase in person. Um, We also do curbside pickup, of course, and delivery. Um, And then we also ship across Ontario. So on the hours of operation for your uh, retail stores, of course, being uh, a kosher brewery, uh, it's not open on Friday night or Saturday. Um, How much of a challenge is that? Because that's when people drink beer is on the weekends, right? So uh, how do you how do you deal with that? So (laughs) you're looking at me. So yeah, it's it. There's always good. It's definitely a challenge. But like anything else that I've, I've ever worked in in my life. I've worked in, in all sorts of environments with, all, with a variety of our models for hours and of, of operation. Clear communication uh, to, 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 your, to your consumers, to the public, um, a reliability on adherence to what you promote and advertise. And frankly, it's our job to make up the difference when we are when we're closed. That means if that means we're, you know, in the winter time, there's going to come a day where we're open Saturday nights, or when we have if the day comes when it makes sense and we're open on Sundays. That's what we have to do, and uh, it re- it requires like anything else as we forecast and we budget and we project. You know, we build that around our ability to not just hustle, but but to, to, to engage the public in a, in a productive way. So let's take a quick step back and talk about the, the certification that you got at, on your website. It says that you have two certifications, both from the Ottawa uh, VOD as well as the KCOR. Um, what was that process like getting that and why even do it? Um, so we'll start with the why we keep kosher. So it's an important, uh thing for for us to have. Um, When it comes to beer, um, flavored beers need to be supervised um, because you don't know what what the ingredients are that are going in to the product. So whenever whenever people are adding fruit or flavors or or anything interesting, um, that does require kosher supervision. And we wanted to to do those those meat flavored products. Um, When it comes to traditional beer, that's just four main ingredients, which is water, grain, hops, and yeast. Um, Traditionally, it's always been said, as long as it's the four ingredients, it's, it should be fine. It's, it's kosher. Um, But we're getting into territory now where craft brewers are starting to experiment. They're starting to add different flavors. Um, You do see brewers putting bacon in beers. You see brewers brewing with oysters. Um, people are putting dairy in beers. Yeah, milk is a big thing too. Milk and vodka, milk and other things too. Right. So this is starting to call into question the equipment. How does that affect the equipment? Because you do use heat when you're making beer. Um, and, um, also when liquid sits in a tank for more than 24 hours, that also impacts the equipment. Um, so, so there's a lot of questions in, in industrial production of, of any food item when it, when it comes to how ingredients might affect something that otherwise could be considered kosher. And um, that's, that, that's just including the stuff that they declare. There's a lack of transparency. 
Right. And when you get into things like processing aids that aren't necessarily needed to be included, um, disclosed as ingredients, um, but are used in the process that that may or may not be kosher as well. So there's there's a lot of questions. Um, I think we're going to see that um, kosher organizations are moving in a direction where they're saying beer is going to start requiring hashgaha, um, especially for the for the smaller. We're seeing it in the States breweries. already. Like CRC has a whole not recommended list. They do, yeah, on the CRC, because they have the most comprehensive list when it comes to alcohol. There's a lot of breweries that they're saying are not recommended because you really just don't know. Montreal Kosher also has a not recommended list on their uh, on Right, they're modeled list. after the CRC. To be clear, they're, the, 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 these agencies are not saying that they're necessarily not kosher, but they're, they're, they're basically saying buyer beware. We don't recommend you engage. Right, it's, it's a we don't know. And if we don't know, then... So, I mean, what about the expense of going through this Hersher process? I mean, beer is whatever, you have a lot of competition and does it, how much does it uh, impact the price point that you can sell for? Um, overall, so the supervision process with beer is not as extensive as, as other things, you know, we're, we're not dealing with um, like restaurants, you know, they need to be constantly checking lettuce for bugs and stuff. So we don't have that level of supervision required. Um, mostly it's a process where we get our, um, I send my recipes into, um, into the COR or to the OVH. OVH. Um, and then we go through and make sure that we have certificates for all the ingredients. Um, so most of it's done online as just like a back and forth, um, checking off, making sure that I'm only using kosher things to make, to make my beers. Um, and then occasionally they'll come in and, and do a walkthrough inspection, almost like a health inspection. Like it's every now and again, they could drop by unannounced. Um, it's just one of the ways that it keeps everyone honest. Um, and uh, if, if I do end up using dairy in a beer and I want to cashier my equipment back to PARV, that's when we would call the rabbi to come in and, and supervise that process. Um, so all of that, um, they basically look at what we need and put it into one yearly package. So we get one flat rate price for, for a year. Basically it's a year subscription. What attraction does kosher beer have in terms of an audience, building your audience, building customer base for you guys in Ottawa, as well as in, in Canada? So definitely people who keep, who keep kosher, who are starting to be conscious of some of the industrial process issues when it comes to equipment. Um, you know, they, of course, are going are gonna to seek out kosher products. The, um, the flavored beer is, is something that the kosher market hasn't had access to, um, you know, being able to have fruit beers, flavored beers. Um, I did do one beer with dairy. So that's, uh, you know, an interesting. It was the first one in Canada. On the, on the Shkacha, you know. What was the, what's the name of it? The COR had some questions for us. They're like, dairy in a beer? What? Are you sure? Um, what's the name? It's called Blueberry Grunt. So it was inspired by a dessert, um, a classic dessert in Nova Scotia, which is where I grew up, um, which is basically blueberry dumplings, dumplings stewed in blueberries. <laughs> um, so I added a lot of blueberries and lactose um, to this to this beer. So it's it's almost more like a like a milkshake than a than a beer, but it's yeah. it's fun. It's yeah, it's it's a wonderful and exciting thing, and it's uh, it's interesting to see everyone's uh, reactions to it. It's it's a beautiful beer. Uh, 1.2, uh, it's important for us, uh, uh, we said as a business to be kosher. Yes, we want to service the Ottawa community, but it's the one, it's the larger kosher community. It's also kosher markets outside of Ontario that we offer a lot of value. But even within Ontario, things that, uh, that I've seen uh, that hold appeal for let's say even forget the non-kosher world, but the non-Jewish world is in the tourist, tourism sectors, particularly in hotels, event spaces, um, thing, clubs, so on and so forth, where they, they host many, uh, co many kosher, much kosher clientele. So th there's, a, there's significant interest there. And so in the Blue Jays games, they have kosher uh, hot dogs and stuff, but I don't know if they have kosher beer. Are you in the Rogers Center yet? Uh, no, that, that that's a bigger fight, but we're not we're we're not on our we're not having the lobbying conversation yet because that's a that's a that's a that's a big fight. That's a a bigger Ontario wide issue in the beer world. 
but um, big companies, things like that. But um, but yeah, there's 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 a there's a large demand for kosher product in that sense. And then just lastly, what I've seen is that those who adhere to other dietary restrictions, you know, for example, vegans, they obviously were not certified vegan, but we this is viewed as another means of of of, of control. Uh, of checks and balances that they 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 are confident in. I think people are starting to appreciate transparency when it comes to the food that they're eating, even if you don't have dietary restrictions, just knowing what you're consuming. Right. Can you tell us about about the backstory for the bitter waitress from 2015? Is that uh, something? Please do. It's so <laughs> the the recipe was originally part of a homebrewing contest. So I was working in a restaurant at the time. Um, and the restaurant served Sam Adams. Um, so Sam Adams had sponsored a home brewing contest for restaurant employees. So we got into groups of four and we brewed a, we home brewed a beer together. Um, and that, that beer was then judged against um, other restaurants. There was a few different levels of the competition. Um, so I got together with a few of my coworkers. We decided to call it Bitter Waitress, just, you know, kind of a cheeky, um, play on, on our professions at the time. Um, we wanted to brew something really dark, really strong. Um, and, uh, yeah, we ended up winning the competition. Um, so the grand prize was a trip to Boston to go in and have a tour of the Sam Adams brewery. Um, so it was a lot of fun. Um, and as, as that was happening was, um, uh, as that was happening, I was starting at the Niagara College program, the brewing program there. Um, so as, as things developed and Ben and I decided to open our own company, um, that was one of the first recipes we decided to, to develop into an actual commercial product. Yeah. That's you on the can, right? Maybe. Might be a coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> Now, it's very untraditional, and I'm going to say this because I'm sure you've heard it before, for a religious Jewish woman to be a brewmaster, right? But that's also cool. It's so cool. Um, you yeah, know, ask how your grandparents if that's so uh, untraditional. Say again? Ask your grandparents if it's so untraditional. Uh, you know, you go back a hundred and, and, and so my many. My grandfather years. was a butcher, so I guess not. My grandmother sold. Fair enough, but my great, but, my, yeah. my, my, my great grandparents would own breweries. You know, um, and often innkeepers uh, were making beer and often they were women. You know, it's uh, it's just interesting. It is untraditional now, but it, it has a background, has a precedence. It does. I mean, it's not really traditional for women at all. Um, you know, like a lot of industrialized professions, it's been very male dominated. We're seeing a lot more women in general in, in the beer industry and particularly in production and in ownership, which is, which is really good. Um, but we, I mean, we don't, Ben and I don't come from a religious background. Like I said, we worked in restaurants. They weren't kosher restaurants. Um, you know, we do have a history of um, being in, in a bit of a different food and beverage world. Um, so we get to bring all those experiences in and, and now do something interesting in, in the kosher world. I just want to switch to uh, a different topic before uh, we end. And that is about your relationship with the Indigenous community and your support for Indigenous issues. Um, I've seen on your social media as well, uh, you know, and your bio, of course, on Instagram has, you know, unceded territory. Some of your um, proceeds in June, July went towards uh, Indigenous charities. Can you speak to us a bit about what that means to you and why you're supporting this? I guess Ben and I had a lot of conversations um, about it along the way. We still do. We do, um, <laughs> you know, because whenever you're you're starting to engage in in the social discourse on with your business, um, you know, it's it's an interesting marketing decision to make. Um, the way we feel is that it is a Jewish value to be good guests. Um, you know. Ben is, of course, very, very connected to Israel. He lived there when he was younger. Um, you know, we understand how, how Indigenous people are very connected to their land and um, how it feels to, to be pushed out of your land. Um, so I think that's, that's just something that kind of 
yeah it, it hits us and then it's something that we want to we want to be supportive of and and aware of all the time and um you know do what we can to to help the indigenous communities here so right now we wait for you know Yantif, um, I know you always wish people at Rosh Hashanah a happy new year on your Instagram and your socials and what have you. Uh, uh, you have eight now beers that are are out. Is there another one coming uh, for, for this new year? Or is anything coming up that we should be expecting? Um, not yet. I'll probably have a couple more new things coming out after the holidays. It's, we're, we're working into a busy time, figuring out the scheduling and everything um so yeah the, the, the brewing something is, is not so much the challenge but you know we can't you know i i just i don't want to go down a path where we have to try to scramble to package beer and and, and everything else during, during these next uh, three and a half or so weeks basically yeah basically september is a write-off for everybody including us we're not even on the air have to have the month of september so i hear you but yeah, so but there, there are definitely plans and there's there there's always, you know, aside from the, you know, the, the, the creative juices that are flowing, there's an aggressive plan to constantly be, you know, reinforcing the brands that people love, but also bringing something new to the table on a frequent basis on basis. I don't want to say weekly or monthly, but definitely I think that's also part of what's exciting everyone to see what else are we going to do. Mm -hmm. Right, matzo ball flavor, of course, or brisket flavor. <laughs> oh no, it has to be it has to be dairy or 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 parv, right? No meat. Yeah, that's right. I don't that's... think I want to do a meat beer. No. No. <laughs> it, it's been done in the trade world, so I'm not putting it. I'm not putting Ew, down. Really? I don't know. Um, I don't. My son would probably go for it, and I hate pumpkin spice. FYI, I would never drink a pumpkin beer. We announced we're not doing one this year. I chuckled. To be con <laughs> to be continued. I saw that. Is there anything else that you wanted to ask, uh, tell us, uh, our listeners, that I didn't ask? Anything? I don't know. I mean, follow us on on Instagram and Facebook, and uh, you know, we're always going to be having new, interesting products. Um, right. Where can people get it besides uh, besides coming down to your your location in Ottawa and um, in the LCBOs across the province? Where can we get this stuff? The fastest and the most effective way to get our beer is ordering online on our website, www.shilobeer.com. Our Shopify store is set up that you know, it's, it's easy to navigate, easy to select. There are various shipping options. There's a flat rate of $15 throughout Ontario, but more importantly, there are free shipping options. And you know, $80 or more, and you can go anywhere in Ontario for free. You know, locally we have similar options. You know, as well. You know, fifty dollars or more, I'll 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 take it across town to Ottawa. Mm -hmm.